afternoon world and welcome to Thursday 19th of May and something a little bit different today. So when I say something a bit different, partly what I mean is I'm actually going to do a video today. I wasn't intending to shoot a video today. We are, or we were, almost 10 days behind on videos. So I've had a couple of days where I've done very little or even nothing. And today was going to be one of those days. But you know what? I've got nothing else to do. So I thought I'd tell you a story. And that story is, well, mine, I suppose. Uh, I would say we get a lot, but we get a few folks asking, um, how did I end up being here? What, what happened in the world to get me here, where I am? Um, you know, a, a, some of you were nosy, that's what it is. So. I'll start at the beginning. I was born July 22nd, 1965, Gloucester Royal Hospital. And when I came home from hospital, I lived in the big house next door called Cannons Court. All the mews and the other buildings, they weren't there then. That was a farm. Um, if I can find a decent uh, aerial photograph that I could upload to show you, I, I will. But um, a lot of the old photographs are kind of faded. Yeah. So I grew up on the farm and up until the age of when I was about seven, all this out here was farmed by my dad and he ran a herd of, I think it was 72 uh, British freezing dairy cattle. We had a little four breast uh, parlour at the top there at the house, which I can still just remember. I can remember the tinker, the old um, sheepdog. Father would open the curtains in the morning, tinker would be sat in the yard and the second father opened the curtains, tinker would go, and well, the cat would probably already at the gate, come up, do the milking. I only just remember going up, getting jugs of milk from the uh, bulk tank. Uh, mother was doing B&B &B at the house to supplement the farm income because the farm wasn't making a lot of money. Uh, my father had bought it off of his father. He had a mortgage to pay. Um, and as all farmers, he was struggling. So mother was doing B&B. &B. And yet it turned out mother was making more on B&B &B than dad was on the dairy yard. So with that thought, um, mother and father decided that they would look into opening, opening a touring caravan site because at that time, touring caravans were becoming quite popular. And at the same time, they were building junction 14 of the M5, literally four and a half miles that way. So father went up to the Australia council offices and spoke to them and they happened to say, do you know what, we're looking for something in the area for touring caravan park. And that's how Cotswold Gate Caravan Park was born. Um, Cotswold Gate Caravan Park, which I grew up on, was a 65 pitch touring caravan site. Um, people could come and pitch their tents and their caravans. They could stay for up to 28 days. Um, and that's kind of how I learned to talk to people because we had guests from all over the country, all over Europe, rarely all over the world. People would come over from the States, hire a caravan or a camper and stay. Um, yeah, and that's kind of where I learnt the knack of talking to people. Uh, so the farm was rented out to a, another young farmer who took it on and father ran the caravan site. I helped dad with the caravan site, but whenever I could, I'd be off helping Phil, who was the farmer who rented the place. Um, all I wanted to do was drive tractors. My, I didn't mind the caravan site, but it was long hours long hours. I wouldn't say dad was a slave driver, but you know what? He had free labor. You're looking at it. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, <sighs> caravan site went on for quite a few years. Mother's health was deteriorating. The big old house wanted some money spent on it. Uh, father came to me. I was 22, I think, and basically said to me, 
would you like to take on the business? Would you like to take on the place and the caravan site and everything else? And I said, no, I wasn't really interested in it. Um, I had enough because at that time, Dad had opened the golf course. I'd been the greenkeeper. I'd been in the, working behind the bar. I'd been doing the pies and pasties. I'd been doing the barbecues. Been cutting the grass. You name it, I was doing it. And I'd had enough. And I said, not really. I didn't want to do it. So, 1987, the farmhouse and all the land that the caravan site and the golf course had, including this that I'm standing on now, was sold. So, regrets. Yeah, loads of regrets. Um, part of me wishes I had taken it on, but I wasn't the right man for the for the job at the time. But yeah, I hated hated losing the land. Uh, so um, Julie and I got engaged. Uh, we'd been courting for almost seven years. She told me she was fed up of waiting, and if I didn't get my finger out, she was going to go off and find somebody else who would ask her. Um, I'd always said I wasn't going to get married before the age of twenty-seven. Uh, she wanted a May wedding, and she wasn't willing to wait, but bearing in mind my birthday's in July, she wasn't willing to wait another year. So that's why our wedding anniversary is on May the 30th, because I, I gave in, I agreed we'd get married, but it would be as close to my 27th birthday as possible. I'd set myself that target of being 27 before I got married. I just thought, I wasn't mature enough, I hadn't done enough, I hadn't misbehaved enough. I still hadn't, still hadn't then, but... So, May 30th, uh, we got married, uh, which is only six weeks before my 27th birthday, and pretty much instantly Julie fell pregnant with Samantha. We bought a little bungalow in Charfield, and we lived there for a year or so. Dad, in the meantime, after leaving the farm, he'd gone to live in, they bought a house in Wickwar, uh, mother was quite happy to live in the town and just be away from um, campers and people for a bit. She'd started a little foot care business called Twinkle Toes, which was basically reflexology and foot care. It meant she could travel around, earn her own little bit of money. She was quite happy. And Dad was up playing with what was left of the farm here, just playing with it, really. He built the big tin barn, and they then got planning permission to build a little three-bed was classed as a mobile home, but it's basically a, what you would call a log cabin, like a holiday log cabin. They built one of those because they could not get full planning permission to build a proper house. Planner wouldn't let them. So they had to get like a three year license to have this mobile home, to give dad time to prove viability of a farming enterprise so that they could then go on and get full planning permission. Well, place only been built about a year and my uncle uh, my Uncle Jack at Tidderington fell quite poorly and it ended up with mum and dad moving out of Bradley to Tidderington, um, leaving this place vacant. And it was a case of, did I want it? Well, yeah, of course I did, I wanted it. So we had to sell our house in Charfield and we moved to, to Bradley. Now, originally we were really going to rent it off my dad. He didn't really want to sell it. But the planners were having none of that. It was a case of, no, you can't rent it out. With the planning on it, you, it has to be owned. And then they were saying, well, Julie and I couldn't take it on anyway because we weren't the original applicants. But um, I went through the app planning application and said, well, the applicant is Mr. and Mrs. Pullen. There's no initials. And the council went, you got us. So we moved in and it took us Again, it's a long story, lot blood, sweat, tears, a lot of hardship. Took us 10 years to get planning permission to build a proper house. In that 10 years, we had to prove viability of the farm, which was basically, I had to prove that there was enough work uh, to um, create 40 hours a week of work, and there was enough money that the farm could produce to pay the minimum agricultural wages, uh, labourer's wage. Bearing in mind that was all off 30 acres. And even today, unless you're doing something really intensive, nigh on impossible. It was a real uphill battle. Luckily, we had some friends in council. They gave us some pointers. They gave us some help. And we eventually got planning to build our house, which we built in, what well, the footings were in 2005. 
house was completed about June 2006 and we moved in and we've been here ever since. Uh, we only had the 28 acres until about 10 years ago when I got another 10 acres off of my dad over the road. Um, basically it was a case of you're going to inherit it anyway, you must have it now, which we were very grateful for because um, it meant there was no more money. He didn't, he didn't charge us for it. So, um, but basically instead of me paying him, I paid, let's put it, I paid for it, but not with money. Okay. <laughs> we, we looked after mum and dad with other stuff, just not money. Um, so it was kind of paid for. And then uh, three, four years ago, the golf course closed. Uh, the owner tried to sell it as a whole, nobody wanted it, so it got split up and we managed to get this 15 acres. So that's how the land, that's how we came to be here. I've always been part of this land. I mean, part of my soul is in this land. Um, I walked this when I was a small boy. Um, I shot it when I was a little lad and I just know this place at the back of my hand. Um, as far as uh, stock's concerned, when Dad left the farm, I took over his sheep. He had a, her a flock of about 45, I think they were Welsh mules, most of them. Uh, most of them didn't have many teeth in their head, but I basically took on the flock of sheep and that we had to build that up to a sizable, um, big enough flock to do our, along with a few other bits and bobs as well, which we won't go into because it's a secret, um, to get our plan in. So I started off on sheep. So the first 10 years, I, I farmed sheep. Um, which is okay because I was um, I did my craftsmanship shepherd at Hartbury College, so I kind of knew enough about sheep to to do that. Uh, I got fed up with sheep, and not only that, I I think our ground here was getting stale because I think sheep had been on it for too long. So we got rid of the sheep, went into the cattle. So 1994, I think it was, I bought my first three Dexter heifers in calf, and that's how the Bradley herd of Dexter cattle started in 1994. Um, it wasn't, didn't take me very long to realise that I didn't want to do sheep anymore. So we stopped sheep completely, just didn't have any more at all. Until of course Abby decided that she wanted some, what's that, about seven, eight years ago? She decided she wants sheep. So that's why there's a few sheep right now. So um, that's kind of how I got to here. I know that's a really compressed down story of how we came to be here. Um, I was always going to end up here. This is... I'll probably die here. I'll never leave here. I just love this bit of the world. Um, and then they what's not to love? It's a cracking bit of the world. We're really, really lucky. And we, we thank our lucky stars and we appreciate how lucky we are regularly because places like this don't come up for sale very often. Um, and if they do, they're an absolute fortune. We bought the land off of my dad, which was just bare land. So all we bought was the land. There was a uplift clause in the sale that if we got planning permission within, uh, I think it was within five years or something, we had to pay another load of money as well, but it took us 10 years to get planning. So that uplift clause never came. But uh, yeah, it's, it's not been an easy path to get where we are um, because we're taking on the farm having the tree company. The tree company, by the way, I started in 1989. November the 9th, the day the Berlin Wall came down, was the day we decided to properly start the tree company. I'd been doing it just weekend work up to then, bits and bobs, um, 1989. So yeah, it's the tree company that basically bought the farm, built the house, paid the wages. Um, and quite often fed the stock and did everything else. So the tree company subsidized the entire farm. If it hadn't been for tree management, we would never have been able to do this because the farm, well, trying to, trying to buy the land, we had 38 acres of land we had to buy and that was at market value. So we didn't get it cheap. Um, so 30 acres of land we had to buy at market price, um, build a house for, for six of us, because four kids, rear four kids and feed everybody and pay our bills. It's, it's been 
hard work. But it was all worth it. You know, we look back at it now and we saw sometimes we think, oh, it'd be nice if we could have got things done sooner, if we could have got our planning sooner, because that 10 year gap between trying to get planning and actually getting our plan in, the value of building the house went up almost double. You know, when we when we first bought the place to build the house we wanted was £75,000. When we came to actually build it, it was a hundred and well, it was 175,000. That's what that place cost me, 175,000 pounds to build it. Um, yeah, yeah. So nothing's been for free. Nothing's been handed down. Nothing's been apart from that one piece of land which we did inherit early, but I did pay for it, just not with money. You don't need to know the details. Just be aware that it was everything's bought and paid for. I don't know. I'll play this back and say, you don't have to drivel on, Ian. But that's kind of the story it is, you know. Um, we've been here, we've been very happy here. We've had some very tough times. We've had some hard times. We've had some happy times, fantastic times. And I think it's just life. And at the end of the day, life is what you make of it. Um, I'm now 57 years old, or just about to reach 57, 56, nearly 57. Um, as far as I'm concerned now, I have everything I ever wanted um, uh, or ever needed, shall we say. There's a few things I'd like, but I don't, I don't need them anymore. As long as I can earn enough nowadays to keep what we got, look after what we've got, make a good job of it, raise the family, maybe retire one day when I'm 95, maybe 96. I think 95 is too early in it for a farmer, maybe 96. Um, yeah, and, and leave the place in better condition than I found it. So, which, as far as the golf course is concerned, that's going to be easy to do because I just walked across there and there's a, just found the raft and ragwort. So I think that's coming here, ragwort pulling again, so. But there you go. So there you are, there's the story of uh, me, a bit about the family, a bit about how we came to be here. Um, I'm here mainly because I was lucky because my father owned it and he let me buy it. So um, it didn't go on the open market, he let me buy it. Um, he could probably have got more money for it if he'd sold it on the market, but I wanted it and he let me buy it. So I, I'll be forever grateful for that. Um, yeah, we paid market price for it, but like I said, he could probably have got more. At the time I know he could because the golf course as it would, would have bought the farm off of him for more than I did but he let me have it, so thanks, Dad. Okay, right, well, we're down here. Should you go see if anything's going in the pond? I only cut this a week ago. Why does the grass in here grow so much faster than out in the field? All right, there's something else I've got to get rid of hemlock we definitely do not want them so I might actually I might actually use chemical on those because I really really don't want that there's a couple more over there right don't let me forget come back and sort the hemlock out that could be row quite big. There's definitely deer in here. I've not seen the, um, any fallow about for a bit, but there are plenty of row about. And rabbits too. Anything going on in there? Not a great deal. I've not seen a single tadpole since um, I put the eggs down here, not one. Plenty of water beetles and plenty of other predators in there, but not a single tadpole, which is a shame. Oh well, next year. So that's kind of where we are now. As far as the YouTube channel is concerned, um, you can go back in history and find that. We started out in 2011 when I was going out on the, with the biker boys, just doing motorcycle videos. 
And it wasn't until we actually did a job for a funky farmer, my mate, Mr. Cornock, and it was him who suggested that I actually converted to from motorcycle videos because I actually got rid of the motorbike by then um, and did this. So you can thank Funky Farmer for encouraging me to do this. Um, and now the YouTube is actually quite a large part of my day. Um, but it's one of those things uh, I've also always got to bear in mind with YouTube is here today, possibly gone tomorrow. Um, it's not something I would be happy to rely on. I wouldn't give up everything else just to make YouTube videos um, because I don't control I don't control YouTube, I don't control Google, and I'm only there by their good grace. So I've only got to make one cock up or upset somebody, and that's it, gone. So I don't rely on it, um, but the support I've had from you guys, um, especially the members, I mean, I was overwhelmed. We, we took that on as an experiment, um, and I've kind of never looked back. So I'm really, really grateful to subscribers. I'm really, really grateful to the members because you are helping us develop this on a much faster pace than we would have done normally. If you understand what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah, I enjoy making the videos. I enjoy keeping a record of what I'm doing. This is like a, a daily diary of, of me and the life of Bradley Farm and Biscuit, because she's the star. So, um, but yeah, thank you for your support. I hope this has filled in a couple of gaps of you know, how did he get here? Well, I was kind of born here. I've always been here. I've never, I only left here very temporarily um, for a couple of years. And then I came back when I bought it off my dad. Uh, and then I got a bit more back when I bought this bit off the golf course. And now I'm pretty much totally contented with what I've got. So not saying I wouldn't like some more. If I could buy more land, I would do it tomorrow. But I'm pretty much contented with what I got, so. Uh, and I hope that shows in the videos. I hope, I hope you understand that um, uh, we know that we have enough. It'd be nice to have some more, but we don't need any more. If I don't get any more, it doesn't matter. As long as I can maintain and look after what I've got and leave it in a better condition than I found it, I will be quite happy, quite happy. So, right, there you go. This is the second version of this video I've made. And I don't know which one I'm going to use, um, whether I use the first one or this one or neither and do it again. But on that note, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for being interested. Thank you for supporting us. And um, yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. How's your day been? Good to see your face. How you doing? Tell me a story I just want to have a conversation I just want to make a friend or two I'm not trying to change your mind All I'm trying to do is Be nice Cause life's already hard enough And you don't gotta act so tough All the time